that's John as a young man, as a middle-aged handsome man, and his 1970 cover, which I was surprised to know he had gotten that early on Scientific American Magazine. And the list, uh, what surprises me is how many entrepreneurs came out of this group of, of graduates. So it was clear not only was this an academic community, but they were supported in thinking about business. So I, I will mention that as I introduce each one of them. He's already told you about Adobe. Those are some of the products that we all know, Photoshop and Illustrator and PDF and so forth. Henri Gouraud, our French connection. By the way, each of these gentlemen is going to talk further this afternoon. This is just going to be a very brief introduction. Uh, and his wife, Sylvie, is here. <laughs> she has the famous uh, eyebrow pencil on her face. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and the source of Gros Shady. You can see the, the shiny result at the lower right there. Ed Catmull, person I've known quite a while. Uh, one of the recent Turing Award winners, I want to point out. There he is digitizing his hand, which you already saw in the introductory video. And uh, Pixar, of course, is the company we started together. And very, very proud to have spent a big chunk of my life with this guy. Jim Clark is not with us, as we heard yesterday, so I'm going to skip right over him. Henry Fuchs. There's the, there's that lovely picture of you as a young man with bright red hair that you sent me. Thank you. <laughs> I think I did a right-left reverse, but just to, to make the slide balance out right. OK. Uh, I put the head-mounted display up there because you worked on that when you got here. And we'll talk about it. It was already done. That's, yeah, I'll let you explain that. OK. And that, uh, that thing in the center is from a New York Times article about the future of VR and AR and all that. Okay. Martin is the source of the teapot to, to, to so many people. <laughs> He's also very important in my career, but that's a separate story. Uh, there he is as a young man and as a handsome older man. And there's the famous, there's the famous drawing. He tells me this is the actual drawing the original drawing of the teapot, I reversed it left right so that it's the same face in the same direction as the teapot in the photograph, but I don't think you can tell. Um, and started a few companies, Ash Larvellum, and those are some of the products, uh, logos underneath. And finally, but not least, is the, by the these are in class order, by, in PhD order. <laughs> the youngster is my old, old, old friend, dear friend, Jim Blinn. So John got his in 69, Jim got his in 78. Uh, I found this, there he is in the lower left, uh, a wonderful picture just the year before he showed up at Utah. Okay. And uh, a wonderful composite picture that I did not make that uh, kind of tells you all you need to know about what a wonderful person he is, that he did the JPL flyby, Voyager flybys at, uh, when that was, a, that was still happening, and then he did bump mapping, environment mapping, and all that. We'll talk about that later. So let's get talking. Here they all are together, but we'll move right on. OK, now. Maybe I'll just stand here. It's too hard to. And here is the mic I'll use for this. Oh, why don't you move those two things? Yeah. No. Just put them right over here. Okay. All right. All right. John, I want to t talk to you about KORF. Okay. <laughs> KORF is this amazing. Uh, well, tell, you tell us what KORF is. Oh, with KORF uh, stands for computer. Aided or you actually going to remember? <laughs> yes, uh, facility. Uh, so, KORF, Dave, Dave Evans came to me and uh, said, Gee, uh, we have this contract through Philco Ford to make a simulator of New York Harbor. 
And the whole idea is Philco Ford is going to build the, the deck of a ship. Of, and, and, oh, excuse me. It, it knew, it, it, Philco Ford's going to build a deck of a ship, and they're going to have five projectors outside of this mock up of the ship. And the five projectors were called IDA-4 projectors. And if you haven't heard of an IDA-4 projector, it's a very, very old way of projecting computer stuff onto a screen. And there were five of them. And they were supposed to be outside the bridge of the ship, and you were supposed to see New York Harbor. And they wanted to use this simulator to train pilots how to go into New York Harbor around over to Staten Island and then up, or up the thing into New Jersey, into the docks. And he said, John, all we have to do is build a computer model of New York Harbor. <laughs> <laughs> and we, we got out the maps and we got out all of the buildings and stuff. And there are literally thousands and thousands of buildings going through. There's the Verrazano Narrows Bridge. You go through that. You go up around the bend into New Jersey and up into the harbor. And there are buildings. There's not much terrain, but there's, you know, Statue of Liberty, things like that. Uh, and he said, all we have to do is build a database in three dimensions so that we can do this. And he said, what we have is we have these five Ida-4 projectors, and they're all going to be driven by, I think it was a PDP-11 or PDP-50. Oh, God. So, but in software, this is? It's all software, yes. Yeah. So we said, well, how the hell do we do this? So we, I, I had an employee named John Gaffney who said, well, why don't we make a little language that's interpretive. And since we can make a little stack language, that would be good. And what we'll do is we'll program it to a big tablet that Ivan Sutherland had designed and gave to us. And we'll put down the map of New York Harbor. And we'll touch on a building. And then we'll go over to a menu and say, it's this high, it's this color, this many stories, you know, and it has this Building. dimension. And so that's what we did. And what we did is sat down at a tablet with the map of New York. Oh, and John Gaffney went to uh, New York and rented a boat and took about 15 rolls of film going through the harbor so we could see what was there. So we spent, oh, God. We spent, oh, well, the contract had a three-year commitment. You had to build this in three years. Evans and Sutherland hadn't done anything for two years. <laughs> so, so we had one year to build this database of New York Harbor. And we used Ivan's tablet, and we did it. And is, is, this, is the design system that you generated there the, where? PostScript came pay, from. PostScript came from? Yeah. yeah it was called uh, Joy, I think, at that yeah. time. And so this little interpretive languages fed this gigantic database of thousands of buildings and everything and all the terrain. And these five projectors did it. And we hit the delivery date. And I've actually driven an oil tanker through that simulation. It's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> and Christy Martin, similar. who's here somewhere, there she is. Uh, let me fly it one night. Thank you, Christy. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Uh, it was one of the more impossible jobs that Dave gave us. Uh, what, what, what came out of that was, gee, if you're building very complex databases and very complex visual stuff, having this little interpretive language that is the underlying growth of that, it, that's the driving stuff that you can easily program is the way to approach the problem. So after the KORF project and after the space shuttle project that we did. Which I didn't even know thing, about. And after the pilot project that we did the same thing. Uh, 
we uh, decided, well, I just uh, decided that we had to, uh, I got an offer from Xerox Palo Alto Research Center where a lot of my friends, Alan Kay and every, William Newman, all kinds of friends were there. And so I went to work at Park. And Park uh, was this gold mine uh, that had all of this incredible technology. And Alan Kay was there. So I'm going to have to, yeah. unfortunately, move on. <laughs> if we don't have much time. Uh, to, to Henri Gouraud. Yeah. Uh, oh, well, first of all, John, we, you told us already how you met David and yeah. Ivan, more or less. How did you meet the magic couple? Henri? What was the question? How did I? How did you get to know? Dave Evans and Ivan well, Sutherland. Yeah. I, I will talk more about the That's Dave Evans stories this afternoon, you know, the French connection. Uh, but definitely uh, I came to France, I came from France with the goal of doing graphics. And I had read Sketchpad and I came, uh, I arrived at the university in September of 68 with a firm intent of joining uh, and attending Ivan's class. And uh, the class was so successful that it was uh, booked up. And I couldn't get into Couldn't get in? <laughs> but I managed to squeeze in, and Ivan very nicely allowed me to sit in. And at the end of this quarter, he told me, I will register you back into the class, and I will become your thesis advisor. Uh -huh. And that was great. You yeah. Know. So that was my first encounter, my first strong memory of meeting with Ivan. And then he told me, go ahead, use this uh, green monster machine that we brought from So that, that was what the head-mounted display? The head-mounted display, yeah. which contains a facility to display Kuhn's patches, okay, in real time. Okay, and go and use that to build an interactive system my goal would be to build a telephone handset, you know, as an example. Let's do it. And so I went, and uh, then next to me, John and Gary uh, Watkins were doing nice things with shaded images, and I was very frustrated to do wireframe. And so I so kind of you. thought about it for a while, and I ex did some experiment. I'll talk more about it this afternoon this again. This is when you invoked your wife. Yeah. And, uh, and then I finally produced some pictures, which I showed to Ivan. And Ivan told me, that's it. You're done. <laughs> Ri <laughs> write it up. And now I had the task of transforming two lines of linear equation into a full-blown dissertation. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we have to move along, but I would like you to tell the story, especially so Ed can hear it, about your visit with Bézier. Oh, yes. Okay. Uh, after finishing my thesis, I came back to France. Uh, the army called me in. I had to go. So I went. And uh, I gave several talks. And I was uh, invited to talk with Bézier. Uh, and so I presented to uh, Pierre Bézier what I had done. And uh, at the, uh, you know, he kind of dozed in through the presentation, <laughs> I noticed. You know. uh, and then at the end of the presentation, he told me, Henri, what you've done is nice, but until I will see the reflection of a neon tube over the shiny uh, car body, you know, I won't be able to use the technology. So it set the goal, and it took another 10, 15, 20 years before you know, re sufficiently realistic images were, were being produced. And even today, I hear that the quality of the paint, uh, the chemistry of the paint is such that it's not just a, you know, a reflection model. You no. have to take into account Several the volume and so on. Yes. It's very complicated. Yeah. OK. That, uh Ed and I almost got funded by General Motors once, who that was what we were going to do for them. But this is way beyond guru shading. Yeah. <laughs> so, Ed, I knew you grew up here in Salt Lake City. That's right. So did you, John, right? Yeah. Olympus so, High, okay. Granite High. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I see. Oh, I see. So, um, 
the story I wanted you to tell was about Alan Kay. You, apparently, he was one of your early instructors here. Well, I, uh, I was in physics, uh, and I'd taken a lot of classes, though. So right at the end, I discovered computer science. So uh, I, I actually got enough hours for getting a bachelor's in both of them. But I wanted to be on the frontier, and computer science was it. So I took all these computer sci science classes, and Alan Kay was one of the teachers. Uh, he's charismatic. Yes, he is. Um, but he's the one that talked about the exponential growth rate. I don't think Moore's Law had been actually been named Moore's Law by that time. But he was saying, this is the rate at which things are happening. Uh, it's extremely difficult for us to even conceive of what this means, but it's going to have major changes. And you need to think in terms of these kind of unthinkable changes. And it's like, that's really cool. Yes, it <laughs> and it was one of those things that, I mean, and I'll mention this afternoon, it's like, it was a touchstone wherever we went. It's like, okay, we can use that as a way of thinking about the future. And so that was one of the last classes in computer science before I graduated. So um, another story I wanted you to flesh out if you can was apparently Ivan, and this surprises me because it didn't fit what I thought the vision of Utah Graphics was, he sent you as an ambassador to the Disney company. Did you tell about that? Well, he knew that what was, I wanted what was his idea there? computer animation, and he wanted to have an exchange program between the University of Utah, because basically at Utah, they were trying everything. They had yeah. you know, the photo lab in the middle, but they also uh, had a math uh, 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 symposium to bring in mathematicians from the outside. And it's like, it was really trying to bring all this stuff together. Um, and uh, so he arranged for me to go out there. So I went to visit um, uh, Disney. I had a great visit. Um, I met Frank Thomas when I was out there, one of the, the nine old men. Uh, and I learned that Disney animation itself had no interest whatsoever in computer graphics. <laughs> And, but they did want to hire me to work on the new Space Mountain Space building Mountain. in Florida. <laughs> that wasn't what I wanted to do. Um, but I, you know, that's when I started the contacts that were there. Yep. I also learned that the only place that might conceivably fund computer animation in the world... Didn't care. Uh, had, yeah, they couldn't care at all. <laughs> so that option was gone. <laughs> Amazing, good story. Well, what surprised me about that story was if I was trying to formulate what I thought the uh, computer graphics vision was and I came up with to represent reality using computer graphics. Not art, but reality. And yet there's that little glimmer, there were some artistic, you just said it though, basically anything would have, Utah yeah, was wide I mean, open for everything. At and that first time. of all, yeah. I originally wanted to be an animator, and then I realized I wasn't good enough. And everybody kind of knew that about you, is that right? Yeah, and I wanted to do computer animation, but I'd have to say the entire field of computer graphics took on as a goal for many years uh, uh, trying to create reality. Right. And they actually got to the point where, you know, they kind of made it really yeah. looks pretty damn yeah, impressive. Pretty good, yeah. And then it started turning into simulation and other things like that, all of which were very important. But they grew out of this desire, and it's like, you know, you kind of get to a goal, and when you've reached it, you're okay. You move on to the next one, <laughs> the next hard problem. <laughs> All right, we have to move on. <laughs> Henry? The next hard problem. <laughs> <laughs> you're the hard problem. No, the... Uh... <laughs> um... Remember this yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's still a hard problem. Yeah. Yes. So, uh, as I understand it, Tell me if I'm wrong, but the head-mounted display at MIT, the original, did not have an interactive device. As far as I know, I was not there, of course, but I... I yeah, but what you must have known... As far as I know, I... Does anybody here, know otherwise? I don't think it did have, but... That, by, got, that got added at Utah, right? So it was by not the time I got there in 70... It already existed already by the time I you... I remember it well. Uh -huh. It had this, uh, for those of you that don't know, um, it had the... Um, it was the following kind of thing. Um, you remember old-fashioned cameras, 35 millimeter cameras had a grip, you know, you could hold it underneath, yeah. and you know, you could, you could uh, press the shutter with a little button that would have a cable up to, you know, the top uh. of the camera. So 
exactly one of these, and the button was connected to the computer, so you can grab something, you know, you can move it around like a line segment or define a new line segment and so on. And the way that the system knew that uh, where it was in three space, again, this was all done before I got there in 70, was that there were uh, three lines, fishing lines, or was it very thin steel cable? Does anybody remember? Very thin lines that were to spring on a reel, and, yeah. kind of like a fishing reel that it springs on it that had a shaft encoder. So then as you move it around, the system knew where that tip was by just the length of each one of these three fishing lines. One of the great things about it was that because they were spring loaded, if you ever got tired, you'd let it go and it would spring up you know, above your head. It was really great. The only difficulty was that now you couldn't really turn it around because of the sort of Damocles, you know, would get yeah, caught I know about in the, the fishing that took lines. the load off. Right. But yeah. it was it was a great system. So again, I had nothing to do with it. It was already here then. <laughs> so what did you do with it? I mean, you you've apparently been following VR and AR and XR and all that stuff ever since. So I blame Alan Kay. Uh, <laughs> I was minding my own business. I grew up in Pasadena, California, and so I was lucky enough as an undergraduate to get. Uh, a succession of summer jobs at JPL, the Jet Propulsion Lab. This was even before Jim. And uh, there, the really wonderful thing was that the second summer I was there, the department had said, several engineers would like to have you assist them. Why don't you go around to, you know, and see, you know, what you would like. The first guy that I went to was the highest ranking science person in the lab, in the imaging lab, Bob Nathan, and he said, you know, you've been working with um, these kinds of things, you know, images coming from the lunar orbiter and so on, but what I think is interesting is if we take this technology to things that are on Earth, like biological images. So look at this. This is, you know what these are? These are chromosomes. You oh, know, can yeah. we analyze these and the shapes and then put them into the right places? Wow, I said, that's the thing. <laughs> I went back to my department manager. I don't want to talk to anybody else. Bob Nathan is the guy. I want to work with this. So I worked with him over the summer, and I went back to Santa Cruz. This was in 69. And I went to my, one of my favorite professors, Bill McKeeman. I said, graphics is it. You, know, you could take things from images. You can make new images. You could analyze things. It, fabulous. He says, very nice, except there's nobody here at Santa Cruz who does anything like that. And he picks up the phone. He had just come from Stanford. Phones in 1969, you remember those? And he says, hi, this is Bill McKeeman. Dialed him or something, uh, yeah, yeah. Bill McKeeman, is John McCarthy there? I only later found out he was the head of the Stanford AI lab. That's right. I was There's there then. Pause. <laughs> uh, is Lester Ernest there? <laughs> I later found out he was the associate head. I think I came during lunch hour or something. There's a little pause. Is Alan Kay there? <laughs> Alan, Bill McKeeman, I got a student here who's really interested in graphics and imaging. Can you take him on? <laughs> and he hands the phone to me. Uh, 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 I stumble. Uh, 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 Dr. Kay? <laughs> no, no, I, I correct myself. Mr. Kay. And then on the other side, he says, actually, it's Dr. K, but you should call me Alan. <laughs> so he took me on one day a week. I showed up at Stanford AI Lab, oh. and he gave me things to read. He dragged me to all kinds of seminars. I saw all kinds of stuff. So what year was this? This was 1969. Now, one of the things that he showed me, I've, I mean, I could tell you about various things that he showed me, resolution theorem proving and things like that. But then he showed me this paper that had just come out, 1968, written by one Ivan Sutherland, who I had no idea who it was, but the title was A Head-Mounted Three-Dimensional Display. Well. It, <laughs> it blew my mind. You know, before I thought of graphics as you take some images, you know, like of, chromosomes or antibodies or space pictures, you move them around, you get another picture. No, here was a three-dimensional world in the room with you. I didn't want to do anything else. I guess you have. he said, <laughs> you might think of going to graduate school there. I had no idea about graduate school. My parents, you know, graduated from eighth grade or whatever. 
the idea of graduate school at Utah was just mind blowing. And so that's how that's I. That's what you did. Out there, yes. All right, we've got to move on, unfortunately. All these guys are going to talk further, I'll say again, this afternoon. Okay. Um, Martin, we all think of you as Mr. Teapot. <laughs> are you sick of the teapot? No. <laughs> Uh, and you're sitting right next to the guy who really took it into its full glory, I would say, uh, Jim Blinn. Um, were, were, were you at Utah when you drew that piece of green engineering pad paper version of it? Oh, yes. Um, I'll be talking about it a little bit this afternoon, but uh, the story as it's told in Wikipedia is quite accurate. Um, <laughs> I was, um, I was uh, sitting, <clears throat> well, I had a need in the thesis work I was doing for uh, generating procedural models of objects because just representing them as piles of triangles was uh, too costly in memory. And uh, so the problem is, how do you come up with procedural models of objects that you can then do rendering experiments on? So I was sitting at tea uh, with my wife and uh, discussing this issue of where you can get models that are suitable for procedural rendering, as one does with one's wife. I mean, <laughs> um, <coughs> <coughs> and she said, oh, well, how about the tea set in front of us? And I looked at it and thought, well, yeah, that's got a lot of the right characteristics. So I pulled out a sheet of engineering squared paper and uh, proceeded to sketch this, first of all, the teapot and later the, all the other cream pitcher and cups and saucers and spoons and things. Um, sketched it on this squared paper. I didn't bother to make it too accurate with the measurements. I just got the proportions about right. Um, if I'd known where it was going, I might have been more careful. <laughs> um, so that's why it's different. But I uh, took that into the... Uh, into the lab in Utah at the CS department and typed it in and the rest is history. History. Mm. <laughs> so, uh, where did you start interacting with this guy, John Warnock? John, John. Ah, um, well, when I came to Utah in the end of 72, I knew about John Warnock, but he wasn't at Utah anymore. He had left, um, and I think was, uh, yes, in one of the places he described earlier. Um, but I knew about him, I knew about his algorithm, and uh, he, he was well remembered at Utah. Um, and my wife and I uh, moved into a basement apartment in the, in the avenues here, um, under um, this lovely old lady's house. And um, we, uh, we got to know her quite well, and uh, she would have us up for cocktails before dinner. I mean, what a landlady. And she would talk about her nephew, Bill. Um, oh, Willie. Okay. I, um, I started to put she, it together here. Tell me about Bill, <laughs> who, who had been at the university and done all sorts of wonderful things. And I thought, I wonder who this Bill character is. <laughs> Turned out this was Auntie Winnie, John's aunt. <laughs> <laughs> Why do they call you Bill? The, the, I don't think, he doesn't seem to admit to this nickname ever. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, through all my schooling, I was, okay, until I got to the oh, university. Huh? You need your mic. Okay, I was known as Bill, and it turns out that when I was about three years old, I used to go around the house pulling out plugs, okay? <laughs> And so my babysitter called me Bill Jones, the plug puller. And somehow that took hold. <laughs> and so all through elementary school, junior high and high school, I was Bill. And, and on my high school diploma, it actually says William Warnock. It's a, 
<laughs> even though that was never my name. <laughs> and, then, and then you did a language together at Xerox, I guess. Yeah, after, after Utah, I moved to Xerox Park, and uh, I did visit. First time I met, I think, and I visited you in Mountain View when you were working on the new Arbor Simulator. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but a shortly after that, you came and joined Xerox Park. Yes. And uh, so that was really when I first got to know John, and uh, we had a natural sort of introduction through the common background at Utah. Um, and uh, yeah, we worked together on the jam language. And, Okay, I'm going to move on. I'm going to move on. It's more this afternoon, like I said. And last, but not least, is my dear old friend, Jim Blinn. The reason I'm saying it that way is because we were roommates at one time. <laughs> uh, during, uh, uh, we tried, to, Ed and I tried to hire this guy several times in our careers. And he would come, and then he would leave. And we'd try again, he would come, and then he would leave. He basically had his own unique programming environment at JPL, and it was his, and he was in charge, and he was a master of it, and he turned out lovely Voyager flyby movies. Why don't you tell us how that all got started, Jim? Um, it was uh, kind of a matter of, of luck, in a sense. I was, uh, I first heard of JPL when I was an undergraduate at University of Michigan, and it seemed like a really cool place to work because I'd always wanted to be in astronomy. But since I wasn't in an astronomy degree program, I didn't think they would have any use for me. So I uh, went off um, to Utah. I got involved in computer graphics in Michigan and went off to Utah. And uh, uh, got involved in computer graphics there. And you know, we'll talk about that more this afternoon. Um, when I uh, went to Utah the summer before, I kind of took a tour around and uh, and uh, on, on vacation in, in, in California, and I drove by JPL and kind of went and kind of looked in the window, and you know they didn't have any uh, uh, tours or anything like that, but you know, verified that it was a real place, and uh, <laughs> then went to uh, Utah and finished up my uh, degree there. And uh, at, when I was done, I I uh, called up Ivan Sutherland and said, uh, he was now at Caltech, and I said, do you have a place for me at your, at your, at your department? That was my interview, and he said, yeah, sure. Um, and, uh, but I said, you know, I'm actually interested in, in JPL, which is uh, part of Caltech, basically. And he said, what I'm gonna do is, you know, come to your department, but then I'm gonna go and hang out at JPL, see if there's a, a project someplace I can attach myself to. And he said, well, that's, that's interesting because um, I happen to know there's a guy at JPL who just purchased an identical copy of all the hardware that you have at Utah, and he's looking for somebody to drive it, <laughs> do something interesting with it. So, you know, wow. And so I came in and, and started doing something interesting with it, and that turned out to be uh, the Voyager flyby movies. They were, uh, there was a line drawing version made by one of the engineers made in Charlie Colhase just line drawings flying by the planets. And here I'd just done all this research on how to do texture mapping. So, you know, what else was I going to do but make that same thing by making a texture map color image of, uh, of flying by uh, Jupiter and Saturn. And so that's how I got to JPL. And you gave us a home there briefly. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, how are we doing, Brian? Well, I think it's a good place to probably Say so thank you to this okay. wonderful, wonderful panel. More this afternoon. That was fun. <laughs>